Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Glenn Carlson. You're listening to and or watching The Dent Podcast. And in this conversation, I talked to Carl Schwantes. Now, if you haven't met Carl, his most recent business that he started and that is in fast growth mode right now is called Five Star Reviews. He helps businesses generate thousands of five star reviews online with Google. His other business, Xenox Diamonds, is a 45 year old family jewelry business. Now you might think, how are the two connected? And this is really where the magic of this conversation comes in because when Carl took over the family business, the jewelry business, he realized that the real magic that he could bring, the innovation that he could develop was about the customer experience. He talks about not just how he applied it inside Xenox, but how he applied that same philosophy to building his brand, raising his profile and becoming a key person of influence in his industry. He's going to go into some specific details on how he used these same approaches to customer service and engaging with people to engage partners like Ferrari, BMW, major media. He's going to specifically break down how he generated over $100,000 direct revenue as a result of his book launch. And he breaks down his formula. He's got five C's for creating partnership, a specific architecture that's worked for him, it's worked for me, and it'll work for you as well. One of the big takeaways that I think you should absolutely be across is the power of five star reviews. So anyway, enough from me. Let's get into this conversation with Carl Schwantes. Hey, Carl Schwantes, finally, we we make it happen. Yes, you know, all, all are mixed uh, COVID and now virtually through Zoom until we can be in person yet again. Right, I'm looking forward to it. I, look, one of the things that I love about doing this is I get to um, learn about things about people that I already know that I didn't even know. I, and if I knew somehow I forgot, I had no idea that you were um, in the artillery for 10 years. Yep. Yep. Uh, 9K sniper, uh, which is the, it's, a, it's a running joke. But uh, yeah, no, I loved it. I love the uh, uh, the military lifestyle. I love the, the structure, the discipline, the, um, you know, and just to get to play with big guns, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a boy thing. Uh, so what, what, what are some of the, what, what's, what's it like? Like, what do you do in artillery like i get it you, you shoot stuff a long way and i suppose you probably get have to know a bit of trigonometry or something to be able to vector oh, stuff it's, in. yeah it's 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 fascinating so um the, the last position that i had was what's called a forward observer and i'm basically the guy on the top of the hill with a pair of binos uh you know calling in the artillery rounds to land on a target and it, it's basically like a glorified computer game. You're like bouncing this round around till you get to where you want it to be. And then you can just crump it with six rounds. Uh, it is just seriously a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. It's Walk just a, in, bo- a boy dream. And fight for effect. <laughs> yep. No, you see, you got, the, you got the lingo. You know what, no, you know what yeah, to say. Yeah. Um, I'm mad. I watched, I watched all the movies. Um, <laughs> and so how did you go from there into the family diamond business? Well, I was always doing a lot of different things all at the same time. I, I don't, I never prescribed to this idea of just working a, a 38 hour week. So I was always, you know, from a very young age, always had two or three jobs at any one given time. So uh, I was doing military study at the same time. I was doing my science degree uh, and just alternating between the, the two different ones. And uh I mean, when I was a kid, I was in uh, the army cadets and I, and I remember at university they had this big, um, you know, you know, tent there. And I thought, oh yeah, the army cadets was fun. I should totally do that as well. And it was absolutely nothing like army cadets. It was like way harder. Uh, but it's something that I've, I've always been very proud of. And I, I did actually have aspirations of going overseas. It's just at the time when there was an opportunity to potentially go to Iraq, uh, my wife and I just had four kids under two. Uh, and I think the idea, the idea of leaving my wife for an, an eight month deployment overseas might have been a marriage ender so uh needless to say that was the opportunity to kind of go okay let's uh let's let's focus on something different do they do they give you a medical exemption for having four kids under two uh no <laughs> no <laughs> i have look i haven't resigned my commission i just went inactive uh and at some point you know maybe when the kids are a little bit older my oldest is 17 and the uh the triplets are 15 uh, you know, in a couple of years, you never know. I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind going in and doing another couple of years because it was fun. I loved it. 
when did you work out you were having triplets? Like, like my, my daughter's two and a half, right? And that's been a, a beautiful experience. We want to have another one. Like, but the operative word being another one. <laughs> the, the idea of of you going for number two and it ended up being number four all, all in the same go. Yeah. Like when, when I'm assuming it wasn't a surprise at birth and you, you, you kind no, of knew that was. No, no. Well, it's the funny thing was, is that actually at the, the first scan, uh, they actually thought it was uh, twins and being, being a little bit of a control freak, that kind of just, just blew my mind because like I'd planned it all out. You know, we always wanted four kids, but it was going to be one now, you know, two years later, another one, two years, another one, two years, another one. And then it was kind of like, oh, man, that's really messed with my plans. Uh, and then when we went for the next scan, the doctor went, I can still remember really vividly. He said, oh, hang on a sec. There's another heartbeat. And, you know, at that point in time, it was like, oh, well, you know, in for a penny and in for a pound, you know, at that point. So, you know, you just strap in and, and you know, get ready for it. Uh, uh, what was it actually like having an inf? Like how old was your first child when your other Three. 20 came. 22. He, he was the oldest one was 22 months when the triplets are born. So four under wow. two. And like, did you have family help or like, what was, what was it like? Yeah, we're very fortunate. My wife's parents uh, live very close by. So they were able to kind of help out a lot. And I guess ultimately when I was going to work, uh, I think there was a few days when I, when I just kind of waved to my wife and just said, good luck. Uh, right. so, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go to work. So good luck. So she's, she, I mean, she's been amazing uh, for that. And I think for the first eight years, she was at home with the kids as they were growing up. Wow. You definitely got the easy job on that one. I think, I think so. <laughs> and so why after the military, why the family business? Why not something else? Why? And maybe just explain a bit of context around Xenix for, for everyone else. Yeah. So, so Xenox Diamonds is a 45-year-old second-generation family business. I, for anyone who's ever grown up in a family business, uh, well, it was true for me anyway. Uh, you know, from a very early age, we were helping out. You know, in the old days, it was folding letters and lick sealing them and stamping them to do mail outs. You know, this is well before the time of email for, for those of us that are old enough to remember that time. Um, and so we're always very well integrated to that. And I think I started making my first rings when I was probably about, I think it was about 13 or 14, you know, but I would always be in the workshop and, and I could still remember watching my dad make these amazing rings. And it was like something out of King Arthur's times where, you know, you'd heat up this piece of metal to a hot cherry red and you'd quench it into the, the water and it made that, that sizzling and popping sound. Yeah. It was just something I think as a kid growing up it was something quite magical. And so I was always there and, doing different things. And then I studied, I did a science degree majoring in psychology at uni. Uh, and I think somewhere in that journey, they changed the requirements between making it a minimum of a master's to making it a minimum of um, minimum of an honours to minimum of a master's. And I really went, oh, you know, that's, I don't want to be stuck studying for another three years, you know, being 25 with a massive hex debt, you know, working the next five years to pay it off, being 30, starting with nothing. So that's where I, I kind of said, well, I really want to double down now into the family business and, um, and yeah, just do, do the best I can. And, and how did you, when you came into it, what were you doing? Were you, you know, were you on the tools, so to speak, or? No, I think, I think I naturally gravitated to the clients. Uh, I think for me, it was always about seeing people at the happiest time of their life. And I just loved the, the, it was almost like a high getting out of these people that were just choosing these beautiful pieces of jewelry, celebrating engagements, Christmas, anniversaries, didn't matter what it was. And I just loved the stories that people would take you on, you know, when they described why they were doing what it is that they were doing. So uh, for me, it was always about the people interaction at the front. I think having a great technical understanding and, and understanding how everything kind of fits together is really important. Uh, you know, you might not need to know how all the CRMs a dent work, but uh, you don't have to do it, but it's good that you've got a, a high level understanding. So for me, when I was with clients, uh, having that technical understanding, I think was really helpful in the way that I could, I could do things. But both of my parents were actually quite artistic in very different ways. My mum is a sculptor, so she can sculpt things out of clay. Uh, whereas my dad was more of, you know, a drawer and a designer. 
Uh, and I, I, I guess I gravitated more towards the drawing side. So I always say that, you know, one of my superpowers is I can draw any ring that you can imagine in 3D in under 60 seconds. And I've seen you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but most, and that's what people go, nah, I don't believe you. So yeah, okay, okay, again. Yeah, you've seen it. Yeah, you've done it for you've done it for me. In fact, you've done it for a couple of friends of mine as well. Um, when did you take the when did you take the reins? Oh, I think it would have been. You know, it was actually really close around the time I did KPI. And, and I think oh, for me it? that was yeah, it was it was really around that that time. It probably would have been, yeah, you know, maybe just a, a little bit before, but not by much. And I think that was the real pivot, pivotal moment for me because I wanted to do things differently. I wanted to be seen as a destination place. I didn't want to be a generalist. Uh, I wanted to really focus on uh, the diamond. And, and having grown up in, a, in a, I guess, a more of a, a generalist jewelry store where you had all these knick-knacky things that, you know, it was, there was so much diversity there. Whereas when you specialize with diamonds, this one diamond could appeal to a hundred people as opposed to like a little knickknack thing that would only ever apply to one or two people. So I love the idea. Uh, and that was very big in the way that I changed and designed the, 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 the store that we have now. So, you know, I think you've, have you, been, have you been to the new store? I, I, haven't been the new one. No, I, I haven't been to the original one, to be honest. We, we could never make it happen. Um, yeah. but, but, I mean, I've seen, I've seen the photos with, like, the whiskey bar. And I, I, mean, yeah. I, want, to, I want to get into talking about experience, um, I mean, and, and how you go about creating experience because you've done that through, through your building. To build your profile, you created partnership experiences and you've created product experiences that, that really create the space around the diamond or the, the product, let's say, to yeah. to convey a whole other layer of value. I, I want to get to that, but, but there's a few things that I'm, I'm interested in and I think others might be as well around because it is a family business, like what sort of succession plans did you have? I mean, was you, is, your, is your dad still in the business? Did, was it a hard break? How did you prepare for that? Like were, were there certain KPIs? Like I'm just curious as to how that happens. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the one of my favorite sayings at the time was, you know, the error of the old is to mistake uh, experience with education and the error of the youth is to mistake uh, education for experience. And the truth probably lies halfway in the middle. You need both. You need both education and experience. And I guess I was coming to the business with a very, you know, fresh set of ideas. It was all the technology. It was the websites. It was all of the social media side of stuff. And my dad had this, obviously, this wealth of experience around, you know, having done it for so long. Uh, and I think we just reached a point where I think when you get older, whether, whether the love for the, the actual day-to-day running kind of wanes a little bit. And I think we reached this natural point where it was kind of like, well, I really want to kick it up a gear. And these are all the things that I want to do. And uh, I think he was ready to also move on to another chapter of his life where, you know, when I when I get to that age, like that's where I want to be. <laughs> I want to be. I want to be at the beach. I want to just be kicking back and, and relaxing. I think you, if you work hard all your life, you want to have that time where you can enjoy it. So, for me, it was being, I guess, a very strong minded person. I think for us, the, the best thing was to actually just make a clean break and just say this is the transition and the changeover, uh, rather than a, a kind of a working in. I would say probably for the next one or two years, he would come in. You know, two times, one or two times a week. Uh, just kind of keep his nose into it and see how it was all working and, you know, was everything going all right and, and provide advice as to, you know, how things happened, you know, in the old days. But I think that's, I think it's one of those things, like when, you, when you're with it for so long, it really becomes a, a fundamental part of your identity. And that's mm-hmm. a hard, that, I think that's a hard thing to, to let go of in the beginning. Was there any friction? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. I mean, you got to remember, like my family is like I'm half German, quarter Italian, quarter Greek. <laughs> like if there were, if there wasn't going to be friction there, I don't know when there would be. So yeah, been, your, your genes are sitting there going off at each other. Yeah, yeah, but like you know, it's, I think, and, and again, anyone who's been in a family business, I think there's always going to be natural friction that happens with that. But you know, we're all in a really good place now, and I, and I think it was one of those things that just happened at the right time for the. Like it had to happen at that time. 
What were some of the first things? So you're in, you're kind of the dad's handed over the, the keys. What was, what was the state of the business from a, and however you want to communicate it, employees, yeah. revenue, size, whatever. And then what were some of the things that you started to, to do differently for good yeah. or for bad? Well, so one of the other big catalysts was we were actually in the process of the lease was up and we were moving location. So that was the opportunity to kind of have everything done in the new way that, you know, the lease would be in my name and, and you know, all the, the, the moving uh, relocation costs and everything were going to be uh, on me to actually do. Uh, at the time, there was uh, we had one jeweler uh, that was working and, you know, one or two salespeople. Um, and I think at the time, it probably would have been about a one and a half million dollar business uh, in terms of annual turnover. Uh, moving to the new place, I think I think it, at, at some point there, I think we had up to four jewelers and a diamond setter uh, and four sales staff. So we kind of grew to about a team of about uh, about 11, I think, at the time, you know, and the turnover was probably at least double that. And what were some of the, what were some of the levers you pulled to create that growth? Well, like, like what percentage of that was just the new location and what percent of it was some of the strategies that you applied? Uh, look, I, I think maybe a little bit the location. I mean, we only moved, ironically, about 200 metres. So, so we, didn't, we didn't move very far. It was always going to be about the middle of the Queen Street Mall. But uh, I think it was a lot about the the positioning around moving to that that predominantly diamonds. It was about this, and in that time, you know, this was when Facebook was just in its early stages, and you know, the prominence on on Facebook and and you know all of the digital strategies around the, that side of things. I think that's really what played at that big part in the shift. And so, in terms of the the KPI stuff, you know, you mentioned that you kind of came towards that methodology reasonably recently uh, you know after the the transition and one of the things i was thinking about with this conversation that i just see you've done so well is number one the customer experience it's just like when i when i think of someone who who knows how to create an amazing customer experience i, th- I think of you um but then i also think about how you leverage that and created experiences around uh, building your profile around creating partnerships. I mean, you partner with Ferrari, you feature in Channel Ten, and like all the all the big kind of names. And um, you know, I, I think it's not unreasonable to be able to say that's pretty damn unusual. If you were to look at the the pool of the vast majority of jewelers and jewelry businesses, you you know, as a result of maybe the following two or three years, that was quite a uh, you, you took a very different strategy. To, to build in business. Can you just unpack a bit of that journey? I mean, I, I, I don't want to kind of, um, you know, blow smoke at you, but it was really, it was honestly really the KPI stuff that really made me really want to focus on being the KPI. And I remember in those days, I can't remember what you used to call it, like the, 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 the brand accelerator day, you know, like, and I remember sitting in, yeah, I remember sitting in the audience there and listening to Andrew Griffiths talk about, you know, that everybody has a book inside them. And that was the really big catalyst for me because I just thought I really wanted to write a book. Um, and it was that whole idea of leveraging the, the IP and the knowledge. So instead of just doing one-to-one, it became a one-to-many. And, and still out of pretty much almost all of my achievements, uh, I would say the book and the fact that it won an international book award for me is probably ranking us to one of the highest achievements that I've had in a business capacity. So it's one of the things that I'm probably the most proud of. Um, Where did the name come from? What the, the, the name of the book, Rock Her World? Yeah, where did that come from? Where'd you get it? It actually, like, it actually, it actually came from uh, like I was there with a um, with a group of KPIs, and we were kind of talking about the books, and it was just we were throwing the 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 ideas around. It was just one of those things that just came out of uh, of a discussion. So I loved the pun and the, and the play on the word rock. So uh, yeah, it was just uh, it was. It's, it's worked out really well for us, you know, within the I first six months. You. Sorry, let's keep going. Yeah, in, in the first six months of the publishing the book, we had, you know, over $100,000 worth of engagement sales that we directly attributed to coming from the book. You know, just in terms of people, we'd hand a book to somebody, they'd take it, go home and read it, and they'd come back the next day and buy it. That's pretty cool. Um, I just want to take a step back because you said kind of when you came across the stuff, you, the KPI stuff, you knew that was what you wanted to do. And I find that's not the default, right? People don't tend to default to 
it makes sense to lead from the front. I think most people, definitely most people would sort of default to, I want to hide behind the business or the brand and hide behind the systems and the processes, et cetera. What was it that kind of rang the bell for you and made you go, no, no, from the front? God knows. I mean, first child syndrome, type 1A personality. Uh, I mean, you know, that's what I did in the military. You know, you're leading from the front. Uh, it's it's just something that's been a function of who I've been uh, from a very young age. And if I'm going to do anything, I want to be the absolute best I can be. I, I, I'm not happy being second place. I'm not happy being um, third place. I, I want to be the best. And I and I think for me, what that's what resonated so much with the framework was was all about being that key person, the, the go-to, the seeing person. Uh, and anything that I want to do in that space, it was like, well, I want to be the number one. So... The, the you kind of you came through the process and then you did the book the book came before the big partnerships or after i think i think the partnerships are i think the book was first because yeah. during the in those days we had to write the book in in like 30 days <laughs> so it was uh we had to write it so like that was during the program that i wrote the book and it was published and and everything within that short period of time so the partnerships came after after that yeah yeah, beautiful. So walk us through the book launch. Like, I think there'd be people that would be quite interested listening um, to be able to know, like, h- how do you make 100 grand off the back of a book launch, right? Because that sort of starts to sit there and go, okay, if it's going to take me a month, two months, three months, four months even to write a book, uh, but as a result of that, I'm going to be able to commercialize it quite quickly. Like, did you have a strategy around that or was that a happy accident? No, no, definitely a strategy. Uh, so we uh, booked out a restaurant. Uh, it was called Aria. They're not no longer there. Um, I think it was Matt Moran's restaurant down there by the water in Eagle Street Pier. And I booked out the whole restaurant on Valentine's Day morning for a breakfast. So that, again, that took some kahunas on my side because I had to basically front up the money to book out the whole restaurant um and the whole strategy behind that was i wanted to put 12 i think it was 12 or 15 couples potential clients in the room that were looking to get engaged and so i put up an engagement ring as the prize um and yeah that that uh, i actually got them to pay to turn up as well that wasn't actually just a freebie so the money that they actually paid actually subsidized the cost of the uh of, of the booking uh, but then we also on the back end then had, you know, 15 potential clients that were ready to buy an engagement ring. Um, and we, it was, yeah, on, it was on, the, on the Channel 9 News as well. So there was some PR that came from that as well. Uh, and, and we got some great video the, footage. How did, you get the, how did you get the news involved? You just reached out to them? Like what was the mechanism for that? Yeah, at the time I was using a PR company and it was just a matter of pitching, uh, you know, the story ideas to them. Um, and it's one of those things in the beginning, you, you kind of hope for the best, but there's no guarantee. When it comes to media, there's never any guarantee uh, that it's going to work. But we were very lucky that uh, there was a camera crew there. They managed to capture the proposal because uh, the person that won, obviously, the ring that we gave, did a live in-person proposal uh, at, the, at the book launch. It sounds like one of those TV shows, um, like The Bachelor or something. Bachelor. <laughs> it's like we're all coming in and are we weird and the proposal and the cameras. Well before The Bachelor. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, mate, that's that's awesome. So so and after that, of course, a bunch of those people uh, came and came and bought, which is beautiful. Yeah. So it was it worked out very well. The the next thing I love to kind of unpack a bit is uh, like you've done great things with partnerships and i also want to get into the major pivot in terms of how covid affected the yeah. business because obviously that was you know i'm um, quite well catastrophic for, for a period of time and and so i want to get to that but i guess i want to unpack a little more of you know how you apply these principles to a you know to a, a reasonably commoditized jewelry business i mean there's lots of people selling diamonds etc um, when did you so when you took over the store was selling all sorts of jewelry. When and how did you decide to focus really just on engagement rings? Well, it really came down to my love of diamonds. Like people often ask me like, what's your favorite stone? And, and for me, it's just diamonds. Um, and at the time I had a really close relationship with a supplier who was actually a diamond cutter himself. And I, I think over the period of a, of a year or two, I just learned so much from him 
you know, in the same way that a mechanic can listen to your engine and tell you what's wrong with it. When I look into a diamond, I can tell you exactly what the cutter did right and probably what they could have done better. So for me, it really came down to this love of, of diamonds. And ultimately, again, with the clients that I was helping at the time, uh, everyone who came to see me was happy. So it was like, you know, I can't understand. I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing is selling diamonds to people that are, are really happy. No one came to see me in a grumpy mood. So <laughs> I think that was just the natural shift. And just and, and again, knowing that idea that that one diamond could potentially appeal to 100 people uh, was also just more of a, I, I could see that as a much more scalable model. It's opening up your market exponentially, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's doing it's doing it's doing more with less because it meant it meant that I could have a, a small core range of diamonds turnover to a, a wider range of people rather than just having you know a hundred items that only applied to a hundred people and and kind of how did you develop because I mean that's so simple but it's often that real simple stuff that's easy to overlook like how did you develop that idea was that just obvious to you or like, did you run some some numbers or some analysis? Was it purely just the uh, feeling you were getting when people were coming in? And you're like, that's just what I want to do, and it ha- happened to have some happy benefits. Like, how did it? What was the mechanism for the decision? It was. I think it was really uh, largely a gut thing. But I guess anyone who's ever worked in a jewelry store, like every day you have to put the stock out in the morning, and then every day you have to take it back in at night. And when you do that all day, every day, and you're touching this one thing. You know, it doesn't matter what it is, you're touching it and you're putting it in and you're taking it out, you're putting it in, taking it out, and you think this thing's not moving. <laughs> and it just and it was just this kind of concept of, you know, having this huge volume of stock that's that's bought, paid for, sitting there, that's not actually doing anything, uh, uh, as opposed to, you know, having these 10 diamonds that would just turn so much faster and were, were applicable to so many more people. So for me, it just seemed like an obvious shift to make at that time. Yeah, I love it. And talk to us a bit about how you leverage partnerships because, you know, I've seen you partnering with Ferrari and, you know, doing some really cool stuff with, I think it was those Kimberly, those beautiful red or, or, you know, ruby Ruby's the wrong word, diamonds. Uh, I might get you to explain that and, and, and sort of just your approach to partnerships in general. Yeah, so having, again, the... The KPI program for me opened my eyes to the value of partnerships. Uh, that honestly was not something that I was aware of prior to KPI, but I took the, the basic framework and I kind of tweaked it in a way that made sense to me. And the way the way the Ferrari partnership now uh, creating partnerships with companies like Ferrari is exceptionally difficult because they're such a strong brand on their own right. They 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 really don't need you. You know you need you need them a lot more than that that they need you. Um, and the way I came to the partnership with Ferrari was actually through BMW and BMW, the, the dealership was owned by the same person. Uh, and I knew that at the time. Uh, so, but I thought, well, it, it'd be very hard to shoot straight for Ferrari. What would be easier and more successful is to shoot for BMW and then leverage into Ferrari, which is exactly what I did. So I started with uh, BMW and I had a framework that I kind of created around the partnerships that I've used since. And every time I've created a successful, profitable partnership, it's always using this framework. So the first, I call it the five C's of uh, profitable partners. And the first C is all about being a client. And I find that when you're a client of a prospective partnership, uh, it's already that, that level of trust and connection is already at a much higher level. So I bought my BMW from the dealership that I was going into. So it was like, hey, I'm already a client. I love what it is that you guys are doing. Uh, The second C is all about compliment. Now, compliment is all about an alignment of values and uh, business processes. So, you know, every time that I got my car serviced there, they would clean it. Uh, You know, they get SMS reminders, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And I was like, hey, that's great. You do that. And we do something very similar as well. The the third C was all about completing their goals. So whenever I go into a partnership conversation, the the conversation is really all about them. Like, how can I help you get whatever it is that I think that you want? And so at the time when I went into the BMW dealership, it was all about, obviously, I reckon your goal is to sell more cars. Well, how can I help you do that? And the way that I came up with was to create a gift card for the diamond shop 
but it had a space for a handwritten part. So and my feeling at the time was that people weren't taking the time to handwrite thank you notes, but that was really powerful when they, they did. So I created this asset that they could actually give out to their clients as a no obligation uh, that would help reinforce word of mouth and obviously make them feel really good about the place where they bought their car. And so that was me trying to help them complete their goals. The, the fourth C is all around uh, coaching. So a lot of times I would, I would have a conversation with saying, well, look, you know, if you've got the data, you could also use this gift card as a birthday or anniversary gift. If you know that that's when the client is, again, it's a wonderful touch point that comes from a place of totally being totally un, unexpected. And the fifth C, and this is probably one of the most important, is all about courting. No great partnership ever happened just from a one-off meet. It's always about going in there, reconnecting. You know, they're almost like your extended sales team. Even just recently, earlier this year, I was in the dealership saying hello to the sales team. And out of that one hello visit, uh, two of the, the new salespeople there came in and bought a rings that were more than $50,000. And they were the sales team. So that's my, that's my framework for, for building that profitable partnership. And it was having established that and that relationship with, with BMW that I was able then to be introduced to the right people at Ferrari. And, then and, how, did you, and how did you kind of lubricate that, that bridge, that transition? Did you go in and say, hey, I've got a crazy idea? No, that comes later. So, uh, no, no, it was, it was all about inviting them to our experience events. So we run these nights in our showroom. We do whiskey appreciation nights. There's champagne and diamond nights. There's, we've even done espresso martini nights, Italian wine and cheese nights. And it's all about this idea that I have that we just create remarkable experiences that just so happen to be around jewelry. And, uh, what I've come to realize more and more, and it's something I guess that I, I knew in, intuitive, I don't know, what, you, what, do you, what do you call that? The unconscious competence. Like it's something that was there, but I wasn't even aware of it. But I remember, I don't know whether it was you or, or somebody else at KPI asked me at one point, you know, what business are you in? And I would say, well, I'm in the jewelry business. And then it was kind of like, no, let's dig a little bit deeper here. What business are you really in? And then it came to me, well, you know, I guess I'm in the romance business. But what I've come to know is that there's a level below that. And what it is, is that at some level, we're all in the experience business because there's no, no longer is this B2B or B2C world. I believe that we live in a H2H world, which is human to human. And at some level, we all want to have an experience. And, and that filters through our perceptions of the product, the experience, the, the brand, all of that sort of thing gets permeated by the way that, you know, we feel uh, about how that interaction plays out. So the experiences that we create in the showroom are all just about experiences, connecting with people, doing some fun stuff that's really kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. I'm a whiskey fan, as you know. And so I was like, well, why can't I have whiskey and just invite a whole bunch of people around and, uh, you know, and just get to connect them doing something that's fun that I want to do. And then sell a whole bunch of diamonds. As a, yeah, as a look, you know, like I mean, people often joke and say, "Ah, oh, you know, you just get them in to get them drunk and and then buy diamonds." But that's not really how it happens. It, it's really just there's there's a fundamental shift in the conversation, where it's no longer like you're on that side of the counter and I'm on this side of the counter. It just becomes like there's just two guys we're sharing a whiskey, and I'm just saying, "Glenn, what is it you need?" And you go, "Well, you know, I really want this, this, and this," uh, and it's just that fundamental shift in the whole conversation and how it plays out that for me has been so pivotal to, I guess, the brand identity of, of Xenox and, and what we're ultimately known for in that experience space. It's so, it's so great to hear how you've kind of went deeper than the product. Cause you know, we say it all the time. If you think it's about your product or service, you miss the point. And it was true for us where coming up to where, you know, if you had have asked us, in uh, you know, 2007, what business are you in? We would have said we're in the events business. You know, we promote authors and speakers and we put them on stage and we build an audience and, you know, they, they then promote their products and services and we, we, we take a clip of the ticket. And we got very good at, at leveraging media and technology to, to build the profile of our clients. 
the GFC hit, our business went to zero. Their businesses kept thriving. We were a fragile business. We'd help make them anti-fragile. And when looking at what's the thing that would survive the next recession or, you know, calamity that, you know, regularly the markets correct themselves. And we were like, well, hang on a minute. We, we know how to produce influence in others. We've been doing it for eight years. We're the plumber with the leaky taps. We haven't applied any of it for ourselves, uh, for ourselves. And all of a sudden our, our understanding of what had the ability to really make us successful from an intellectual property perspective totally changed from the the outward manifestation of the product that we had at the time. And I think this happens, I mean, it's the, the same with Darren. When Darren realized he wasn't in the business of selling boats, he was in the business of creating experiences for families to be able to reconnect and have quality time, everything shifted. And I just see that so much in the KPI community where people tap into that real mechanism for where the value really lies. Yeah. And you know what? It's fun and you enjoy it even more. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, there's, there's something, there's something really, there's something really interesting about it. And I love seeing how you, cause I mean, you, you do, you create those experiences that are at a world-class level, literally. Um, what, uh, how did that lead to Ferrari? One of the other things that I love about KPI is pitching. So I'm always, I'm always pitching. Doesn't matter if I if I meet somebody, I'm I'm pitching or you know, pitching maybe has a, a negative connotation. I'm always planting seeds. I'm 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 an ideas person. And so at the time, uh, you know, at when when one of the 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 managers and, and the 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 what do they call them like the promotional events coordinator for Ferrari was in the showroom, you know, I was planting the seed and the idea around um the whole idea about argyle pink diamonds which was this really rare and you know what's even rarer than a, a pink diamond a red diamond a red diamond like they're incredibly rare and very expensive like we when we, when i when i created this event uh i actually even got them to i i got the um the brisbane city council to allow ferrari to park one of their ferraris in the middle of the queen street mall below our shop so, you know, it was, again, from their point of view, and we had big event letters and, and all of this sort of thing. It was really quite a nice spectacle. But, it was, again, it was a profiling thing uh, to kind of put Ferrari on showcase and, and offer their members the opportunity to, to really see something that they wouldn't normally get to see. Like the, these, pink, these red diamonds, like a half a carat one was about a million dollars. And that was however many years ago now. I'd hate to think how much they're worth now. But it was that opportunity that Ferrari could offer their clients something that they just wouldn't normally get to see, do, touch, or feel with. And that was, that was the unique angle, I think, that really appealed to uh, the guys at Ferrari was that, you know, when, when someone has a beautiful Ferrari, it's, 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 a, it's beyond the reach of what most people can probably have access to. And, and that was the same thing but in a diamond. Where do you get these ideas from? Like the book launch, that partnership strategy of finding this kind of unique piece to make it work? Because really to do that, you've got to be sitting there going, what's in it for them? What can I, what can I bring of remarkable value that really has nothing to do with, you know, selling me selling diamonds? It has to do with them being able to create an experience from that. Like where, does, where do those ideas come from? You know, uh, and I've told you this before. Um, you said something to me very early in the in the piece that really just absolutely hit me at, at my core. And you said to me, and I'm going to paraphrase, but you said to me that your your greatest like joy or or life's mission and purpose comes at the intersection of your two greatest values. And I remember drawing this little you know X. And on one side was experiences and the other one was high quality products, values, you know, services, basically people that are, are mastering it, the, what it is that they do. And so for me, the time when I'm at my absolute happiest, I'm um, just in my absolute flow is when, I, when I'm doing things that are experience relate, related and with products, companies uh, that are really at the top of their game. 
Uh, and then for me, it's just the ideas. And I, I have three questions that I ask myself when I'm, when I'm sitting there coming up with these crazy ideas. And the first question is, uh, what would you do if there was no itty bitty shitty committee sitting on your shoulder telling you that it won't work? Ah. The, sec- the second one is, uh, which is kind of related, but it still gets my, my, my brain thinking in a different way, which is what would you do if there were no rules? Like literally there was like, you could defy the laws of gravity. There was no one, there was no rules. Third one is, um, so somebody who's been a great, I guess, compass point for me in my life is uh, Sir Richard Branson. And I've been fortunate enough to spend a couple of weeks with him at his home on NECA and also in Africa at at his private game reserve, uh, Ulu Saba. And the idea that Richard, when he first started the Virgin brand was he was so dissatisfied with what flying on commercial airlines was like that he said to himself, if I was going to build this in a way that I would want to experience it, what would that look like? So the question I ask myself is what would Richard Branson do? Because I find that if, if, if you can come at it from a really 50,000 foot level, and you have the idea, it's always easier to scale it back, but you can't go the other way, if that makes sense. And so, you know, in terms of doubling the business, to what degree would you say that kind of thinking and that kind of approach, like your approach with the books, your approach with the partnerships, et cetera, to to what degree do you feel that had an effect in terms of your brand versus having an effect in terms of your balance sheet and your P&L? Oh, it, it was all interconnected. Like at the time, you know, when we're talking about profile, I, I made a decision that uh, I was going to wear a three-piece suit, you know, and it was just something that was just different. Nobody in the industry did that. And it was just like, I get, I became known as the guy that wore a three-piece suit every day. I didn't care whether it was the middle of summer <laughs> or, or whatever. I was always wearing a three-piece suit. And, and I guess that was part of, it, it was everything. It was the image. And it was that, that building up of the, the personal brand that sat underneath the company brand, if that's kind of where I think you're going, is I, I believe that the two were mutually supportive of the of each other and that one shouldn't be um, at the exclusion of the other. So I, I thought that they were both important, but to just hide behind the company brand, I didn't think was serving the whole business as a whole. And I think for me, that that's what really helped translate down to the bottom bottom line and everything else that we did because it wasn't just you know xenox that was going out to create a partnership with ferrari it was xenox and carl and the the two things together worked very harmoniously super cool i just i just love it um and if anyone wants to check out uh xenox how do they do that well they could i mean you could just type in xenox diamonds into the um into the the google search bar so that's x e double n o x and then diamonds i think one of the things that you'll probably find show up first is our Google reviews. Uh, and I think we're at, at the time of this, I think we're on about 750 uh, five-star Google reviews for the experiences and what it is that we're, that we're doing for our clients. That's just mad. When did you bring in the Google review feature? That started, I would say now, that started about five years ago. I think okay. it's when we started focusing on that as a strategy, as a marketing strategy. And I really... I see it in that way in, in a very strong sense. I see it as a marketing strategy. Um, and the idea to me came for that was, I would say to people, go out and give a great experience. But the difference is, is that your definition of a good experience is different to mine. And there was no way to, like, I guess, metrically sort of score that. And I thought, well, how do they do it in America? In America, it's a tipping system, right? Like, so if you go out and give a great experience, you get a bigger tip. And I thought, well, rather than tell my team to go out and give a great experience, what I said to them was, I want you to go out there and give a five-star Google experience. Mm. And it was very easy then to measure, did you hit the mark or not? If you did, then you got the the review. Uh, If you didn't, you know, you either got a four-star, three-star or no review. And so it became this, this process of actually just benchmarking the team to the experience, and, but at the same time, giving them the latitude to go out and do it their way so without overly constricting and constraining them. So one of the things that I would also say to my team is you've got $100 to go out there and surprise a client 
in any way that you see fit. Don't have to ask, don't need permission. If you need to pay for their parking, if you need to pay for lunch, if you need to, and that was hard, like in the beginning, because it, like, oh, holy crap, like what if they all do it? <laughs> you know, but the truth is it, it never really happened that way. You know, occasionally it was a bit of this or some coffees, but it was that personalizing nature and empowering uh, the team to go out and, and surprise and delight their clients. Because I always, I always used to think that two things were interchangeable, surprise and delight. What, I, what I've come to realize is that they're two very different things. And the conversation came to me when I was with a client and I was talking to them and they said, well, we, we bought two uh, Porsches. I went, oh, that's amazing. Uh, they must have really kind of looked after you. She said, yeah, you know, we got invited to these track days and there was champagne nights and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was nice, but we kind of expected it given how much money we spent. Mm. So she was, you know, she was delighted, but she wasn't surprised. Mm. And that's when it came to me. It's like, you have to do the two things at the same time. And so whenever I'm crafting these experiences, the, the, thing, the thing I ask myself, the question is, what can I give this client that they didn't think that they could ask for? And so when you, when you can give someone something that they didn't think that they could ask for, it's, it's really a, a, a game changer. So when people come into me, and I, and I believe in crafting experiences within experiences. So when someone comes into the showroom and one of the first things I might say to them is, you know, can I tempt you from anything from the bar? And if there's, a, if there's a momentary pause, I know it's a yes. You know, it's like, the look at the clock, is it five o'clock? No, okay, great. <laughs> but, but then I'll go through a whole experience of talking about whiskeys and this one's from, you know, Ireland and this one's from Scotland and this one's an Australian and, you know, single malt. And, and this client's getting this experience that's actually happening within another experience. And it's something that people wouldn't normally expect that you would get when you walk into a diamond store. We, um, we have a, it's a super simple little, little model that's not ours, but around expectations. Um, and we, we kind of say people are either going to have neutral energy, down energy, or up energy. And the idea is, you know, if you um, deliver on all your promises, right, what energy is, is going to occur? Is it going to be up, neutral, or down? And most people will default to say up energy and it's like no interestingly enough if you deliver on your promises because you've told people this is what you're going to get you've set those expectations so when you deliver upon those it's like you've done what you said you were going to do it's actually neutral energy so you really need to go above and beyond the promises to create any kind of surprise and or slash separate <laughs> delight um and of course if you don't deliver on your promises uh well, then that's a, a down energy and i think that's really important what you're talking about to think about how do we go beyond delivering on promises and how do we go beyond doing what we say we will do and if we're going to deliver an exceptional experience that people expect how do we even go beyond that and that's what i just think you do so damn well yeah and and you know really for and I'll probably get to it in a minute, but when, when you see where I'm going with the, the whole five-star uh, reviews and the experience side of things, like the, there's, a, there's a term that I talk about in, in that, which is in the, in the next book that I'm writing at the moment, uh, which if you're familiar with Google's zero moment of truth, uh, yeah. which is you know, the research that people do prior to coming uh, into your business. And in the old days, it used to be that people would shortlist you to three, thereabouts. I'm actually seeing it now. It's probably one, if not two. People are so time poor that they just want to go, who's the number one person on Google? You know, what do the reviews say? That's the one I'm going to see. But the first moment of truth being the first time that they interact with you, either walking through your store or talking to you on the phone. And the second moment of truth is obviously when they use your product or service for the first time. So I've come up with a, with a word or a phrase that I call the MMOT, which is the magical moments of truth. And when you think about magic, like what is magic? You know, magic is just this thing that's got this wonder to it. It, it. it happens even though it's in plain sight, but there almost seems to be like a disbelief as to how that actually happened. And you're almost in this, this state of shock and awe as to how that actually happened. And so a lot of times when I'm crafting these experiences, I'm looking for magical moments of truth. Um, and it's probably best to illustrate it with a story because it's a very hard concept to to conceptualize. 
So I had a client that came and saw me because they wanted an eternity ring. And when I was talking to the client, I said, well, you know, that's lovely. It's how many years have you been married? That sort of thing. And the real reason that he, that he was purchasing the ring came out was because his wife and he actually had a miscarriage. So he wanted to do something to really cheer her up. And that really resonated with me because actually between our first child and the triplets, my wife and I also had a miscarriage. So I, I, I guess I got really connected to where the client was coming from. And so what I said, I said, look, I, I, let's just put this to the side for a moment. And I, I feel like we need to have a whiskey. And so we walked over to the whiskey bar. And if you can visualize this, I've got a whiskey bar in the showroom that's got like four different shelves with different whiskeys from all around the world. Unbeknownst to the client, I have a secret hidden compartment that is below that, which is a push panel that opens gotcha. out. <laughs> and there are these like super high, like, like 150 to 250 dollar bottles of whiskey, and I said, I, I I just feel like that that we need to go to this kind of it's a behind the velvet rope experience sort of thing, you know. And I feel like this is where we need to be. And he was like, he was like, oh my god, that's amazing. Um, and so for the next 20 minutes, we're sitting there and we're talking about you know how he's going to do it. He's going to take her away for a couple of days, and they're going to do restaurants and and this. And I said, okay, so is that where you're going to give it to her? And he said, yeah. So he picked a restaurant and I was just coaching. I, I mean, I do a lot of coaching with them through that process. So how are you going to do it? Don't do it there. So there's, there's another concept that I teach, which is called the happiness window, which is all about the optimum time of happiness is ultimately when you ask for a Google review, but you can use it with so many different things. So I was like, when are you going to give it to her? Okay, here, do it here, not there. You know, if she's a private person, do it here, not there. And so I was coaching him a little bit through how to do that. Uh, and then I thought, I'll tell you what, I've got an idea. And so I went out the back and I have this special ring box that I save for special occasions. And it's actually got an LED light built into the ring box so that when he opens the ring box at night, there is this light that just shines on the diamonds as he gives it to it. And when you think about that now, so when I think about magical moments of truth, it's how do you create these profound impacts on your clients so that the idea of going somewhere else just seems unthinkable? Because mm -hmm. I, I guarantee his perception or his you know, recollection of what that experience was like, you know, th there's nothing else that I, I think you could find to rival that. I've got to ask, I just, I love the story, but it's just made me, it's made me want to know, do you sometimes end up having a couple of those clients come in and you end up getting lit at work accidentally with a few too many whiskeys? <laughs> no, because I, I always drink it neat. So you're only ever having like a shot and it's just neat. And for me, whiskey is like a, a really nice bottle of red wine. It's when you, when you really appreciate whiskey for what it really is, uh, the complexity of the flavors and and all that stuff. You really don't need much, and it's. I, I would rather have uh, a shot from ten different whiskeys than than ten shots from the same whiskey. So no, it never gets that way. Talk to me about COVID. You know, COVID hit. Uh, I can remember when I first heard about COVID. I was actually snowboarding in Austria with my cousin. It was January uh, 2020, and it was this whole COVID thing was you know unfolding, and it was. I, I think there was just this sense of. Um, you know, unrealization as to what was actually going to happen. Like, oh, it's just going to be a three-month thing. It'll be over. Uh, and so, you know- two, land weeks, uh, two weeks to flatten the curve. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, you know, arriving back uh, in January and, you know, it, was, it became very clear that, no, this is actually not a two-week thing. This is becoming bigger and bigger. Um, and I think it was about March when it really started to hit the fan- uh, the government came out and banned weddings, which is particularly devastating when that's 97% of what you do. Um, and we pretty much lost all of our revenue for eight weeks. What I, what I became really connected to in that time was the impact that uh, mental health can play when you're in, when you're in the, the pilot seat of your business. Uh, because, you know, on the one hand, we had everybody that was in a potential deal flow that just basically ghosted you. They just didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to respond. We had a whole volume of work that we'd actually completed. 
uh, when we said to the clients, look, you can leave the, the jewelry there, just pay for it. And they, no, no one wanted to pay any money. And then on the other side, you had all these suppliers basically ringing you up saying, if you don't pay us, we'll sue. And there was no foreseeable end to when that would change. Pretty, I'd have to say out of, out of my whole business career, that was probably the lowest point that I can ever remember. You know, so it's, it, how, how did it come to shift to doing something different? It's, I'd like to say that it was just me that came up with that idea, but uh, I have a, a mutual friend of ours that you know also very well, David Dugan. And, you know, it was a matter of, of just talking to him, just going, and he, he'd been tapping me on the shoulder for many years to say, look, you need, there's, more, there's more that you have to offer. It's not just about the diamonds. There's other things that you have in your skill set and the way you see the world. And I was always like, nah, like it's something that I'll do sometime. And what, what the COVID thing really did for me was it really kind of kicked my butts, you know, dragging and screaming where there really wasn't any other choice. It was, it was almost like this was the bar fight where you, you know, smash the bottle and it was, it was on. And I, was, I didn't really have any choice but to, to really make it work. And, and so I started down this road of just going, well, what else am I really passionate about? And what I'm really passionate about is customer experiences. And it was looking through the numbers uh, from Xenox that I went, holy crap. Like, you know, in 2019, the year before, we'd had 173 sales, which was more than three sales every week that came to us because of our Google reviews. Like they'd listed that as the core reason is that the reason that they chose us. And that translated to more than a million dollars in top line revenue. And I went, isn't that interesting? I thought, well, could I teach people how to do that? Yeah. So uh, using the kind of oversubscribed method, I put a post on Facebook and said, you know, I've been asked by a dozen business owners in the last uh, couple of weeks how we generated, well, at the time, you know, 500 Google reviews. If you'd like to know more, you know, type Google below. And people just started typing Google, Google, Google. And so what I did was I then created a Facebook group and I said, well, look, you know, come into the Facebook group and I'll, I'll give you some, you know, some value through there. From the Facebook group, I pitched a webinar. From the webinar, I sold 20 people into the first program uh, for a revenue of about $25,000 for a program that I hadn't created, which is like super unusual for me because I'm a creator by nature. So I would normally have created it and then tried to sell it, but the oversubscribed method was way was way better. Uh, and so far, I've gone through four iterations of the program. Um, and it's just evolved to the point where it got to the point where I, I looked at it and went, is, is this really about Google reviews or is it about something bigger? And I, what I've come to realize is that it's something much bigger. Uh, and when I look at the best world-class businesses in the world, like if you had the opportunity to own, you know, whether it was Ferrari, whether it was the Ritz-Carlton, uh, you know, interestingly, have you heard of the store Chick Fil A in America? They're no. like a they're like a chicken sandwich store, a franchise okay. thing as well. Um, McDonald, the average turnover a McDonald's store in the USA is about two and a half million a year. Uh, the average Chick Fil A uh, store does about seven million, and they are closed for about two to three weeks of the year because of um, religious holidays. And the key fundamental difference between the two, apart from the food, uh, to a little extent, is the ex customer experience that, that they really focus on. And so when I really looked at it and going, well, well, what do these businesses all have in common? They have lots of lead flow. So potentially more clients that want to work with them than they can handle. They have an incontestable reputation in the marketplace. And they create remarkable experiences for their clients. And so this framework that I started building out of this came about, well, what are the things that you need to do to get all of those things? And so the, the first part of that is the foundations. Now, in the foundation stage, it's all about the beliefs. Like, what do the, the people in the business need to believe about being a stand for the customer journey, uh, what it means to, to go that extra mile for the clients and do all of the things that we've spoken about? You know, ownership. You know, is there somebody in the business that's actually going to own this as a strategy in the business? And it should never be the business owner. 
because the business owner is focusing on other things. So usually the businesses that I coach, the ones that that really work well is when they've got a practice manager, a 2IC, that, that can be that person. Um, the third stage is all about the metrics. It's all about lead scoring. Most people don't drill down deep enough when they're asking a client how they found them. Like sometimes people say, oh, I came in because of Google. Oh, that's great. Was it the website? Was it our Google reviews? Was it our Google My Business? You know, it's really important to, to know which one of those is the reason the client found you. I had a client recently that uh, I was talking to him. He just spent $50,000 on Facebook ads to generate a cost of, lead, a cost of sale at $1,000 per client. Now, the problem with that is that he has a subscription-based business where his core product is $100 a month. Mm. It makes no sense to me. And I see it time and time again, people spending thousands of dollars on uh, ads, whether it's Google ads, whether it's Facebook ads, doesn't matter. That is simply not delivering a tangible result. And so that, that, that upsets me greatly. The second phase is all about the game. Google is a game. It's a game with rules and it's a game with a scoreboard. And it's very clear who the winners are and who isn't. And in, in, the, in, the, in the game phase, it's all about the differentiation. So how do you be not just 10% better? How do you become so radically different that you become the new benchmark by which all others are judged against? So everything that we do around that sort of the whiskey and, and it's like, well, that's, that's the standard. I can't, and you, get, you know that you've hit it when people say, I, I just can't compete with that. And, and then you have the magical moments of truth, which we've kind of gone through. And then the last one is the Googleization. So the Googleization is the scripts, the systems, and the tools that we use in our business to generate and collect. And basically we turn these, you know, we, we craft these remarkable experiences that generate testimonials, that turn into SEO powered Google reviews, that drive leads and sales to the business with a zero dollar cost marketing spend. So I, I've yet to find a marketing strategy that works better than that. Do you have a, I just love it. So, so hang on, correct me if I'm wrong. So what? So it started off just thinking about Google reviews, but then you started thinking about, well, hang on, let's reverse engineer. What is it that causes Google reviews to happen, customer experience? And so you've unpacked an entire, an entire uh, methodology around that. When you sell it to people, right? Because I, I've also had the experiences where, you know, you talk about five-star reviews and people are like, oh, yeah, I want that, as opposed to if you talk about, oh, learn how to create remarkable experiences in your business, it's like, it's less less of a hook, although that's maybe what they need. It's not in their mind as, as what they want. So how do you how do you pitch it? Uh, well, pretty much like I just did then, <laughs> you know, which is all about just taking your client. Like most people can understand uh, client testimonials. You know, they've either collected you, them on the website. But you, mean, you, lead, you, lead with the experience, you lead with the five-star reviews first. Like, let's get that outcome, more leads, more sales, zero-dollar yeah. cost marketing spend, et cetera. People go, yeah. that sounds sexy. And then it's like, great, this is what's required to make it happen, yeah? Yeah, like, and you can do it and you can be successful with it. But uh, if you really want to be at the very top, if you want to be number one on Google, if you want to have... Uh, lead flow on tap. If you want to create profound impacts with your clients, uh, like that's where you take it to the next level. And that's the the kind of the ratcheting up. Um, the third part of the model is all about the team. And again, if, if you know anything about Richard Branson, you know that he, he sees the people in his business as being one of the significant assets to his business. Uh, and so in the team phase, it's really about the team identity. You know, so... Uh, I look at team as, as the, like this is a part of the core values where serving your clients as a noble service without judgment, when, when they really get that and it, it filters through every aspect of, of the business, uh, it just has a profound impact on the way the business works. We used to have a core value at Xenox that was, we called it the greater good. And the greater good in its first iteration was clients, business, team before self. You know, the whole idea is that if we look after our clients, that's important. Then we look after the business because the business is the vehicle that's providing everything. 
And what I came to realize is that I had the order the wrong way around. So the way that we have it now is it's, is it's client's team business before self. Because if you look after your team and you have the right team, they're going to look after your clients in a way that, that, that fits well with you know, what your business stands for. The next part of the model is all around the, uh, the discipline. So what are the rhythms, the routines, the, the daily huddle, the weekly retrospective, the monthly, the quarterly, the annual target setting? You know, is this Google review strategy uh, so much so part of your business that it's just another line item on the agenda? It becomes the new water that you swim in. So that, you know, of course, we're going to talk about experiences, you know, as much as we're going to talk about top line revenue, as much as we're going to talk about, you know, all of the other elements that you might be tracking in your business. And the last one is, is, is one that I, I've got to find somebody that's amazing with numbers. And maybe you might know somebody, but what, I, what, I, what I've come to know is that having a Google review portfolio with however many reviews you need, but if I look at Xenox and I go, well, now if I look at the, the business and over the last six months with this, with this transition, six to eight months with this transition into the Google stuff, I've appointed a GM uh, to run the business. So I'm only there one to two days a week. Um, but now if I look at the business valuation of that, of that company, thinking that there's this asset attached to the business that generates a million dollars in top line revenue, independent of me, the business owner, or any marketing I do, it has to have a multiple effect on the business valuation. 100%. There's no question. Like that's got to be like when you get to those sort of numbers, that's got to be a, uh, a pretty significant asset given the fact that you can link it directly to um, revenue. I mean, the, the fact that you've had revenue directly linked to the book, to the, to the Google reviews, to the partnerships, I mean, simply the fact that you can demonstrate that you've partnered with Ferrari and BMW and, you know, uh, featured in Channel 9 and all the other media, et cetera, all of those things go to demonstrate barriers to entry. Um, because, I mean, if there's, you can be doing all this fancy stuff, but if there's no real barriers to entry, if it's easy for anyone to kind of copy you to do it, that's going to reduce the multiple, right? And this is kind of where brand comes in. Is brand is one of the ways. You know, if you're an energy company, well, okay, one of the barriers to entry is I need equipment and mines and all this sort of stuff. So as a small business owner, one of the ways that we can improve our multiple is, is locking in the brand and creating that differentiation you were talking about that literally makes the competition irrelevant. And when you've got any one thing on its own, probably in my experience, isn't going to do it. But when you can get a stack, you know, the book, the awards, the partners, the Google reviews, and it's like stack, 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 you end up getting a significant multiple impact and you don't need a big impact. You need an extra one or two on the on the multiple of your valuation and that is the difference between a nice exit and a life-changing amount of money yeah so yeah. are you are you thinking of are you thinking of selling uh no <laughs> but then that's the point like if you set the business up uh, in a way and you've got the right team why would you need to i couldn't agree more so are you back open now oh yeah yeah is everything's pretty much back everything's pretty much back to normal uh things are sort of ticking along but again we're always looking for different things that we can do to kind of um, just take that experience to the next level. And um, yeah, it, it, there's, I always say, you know, the thing I love about KPI is it's not a, in the, in the days when we did, it, it's not a 40 week accelerator. It's a way of life. And the lens of which I look at our business, whether it's the five-star business or the Xenox businesses is in the five P's. How can we constantly uh, be creating these things that that set us apart from the others. So, you know, one of the books, so the, the book that I'm writing for the five star, but I started writing another book before that, but COVID kind of interrupted that. But the working title for that book is How to Plan a Wedding That Rocks. Yeah, awesome. and, I remember you telling me about and, that. Yeah, and so the idea there is me to interview 100 uh, bridal professionals and extract from them all of their IP and the great questions that people need to know when they're planning a wedding. So again, there's, it's never done. There's always more to do. Um, and that's what makes it exciting. And so when someone wants to work with you on the five-star Google reviews, what's the process? What happens? How much is it a, 
a do it with you? How much is a do it for you? Um, mm. might, like to what degree is the, the Google work? Because, uh, you know, does that get fiddly? Do you guys handle that? How does it, how does it work? So what I, what I do is uh, generally people start with like it's kind of like a, I don't know what you call a prelude program, which is really what I call a seven-day challenge, which is all about getting their Google My Business like reset and recharged. So making sure that they've got things like geotagged photos that are keyword tagged, bios that are specifically keyword driven, all of that sort of stuff, uh, really getting that humming. And then we move on to the Google Mastery program. Um, the two things together, like your Google reviews and your Google My Business accounts for 49% of your SEO. And it's all free. Like you don't have to pay anybody to do it once you know how to do it. So the Google Mastery program is really about walking them through the model of the things that we spoke about, you know, with the foundations, the game and, and the team. Uh, and that's done. The, the whole premise around that is 100 Google reviews in 90 days. So uh, I used to do it in five weeks uh, and there was at least two or three people in every program that could, that could do 120 plus Google reviews in five weeks using our framework. But there was a percentage of people that, that just got busy with work. So I thought, well, I'm going to make it longer and make it bigger to give more people the opportunity to kind of hit that 100 milestone mark. Because what I, what I find is that when people hit 100 Google reviews, they generally start to see one new client every three to four weeks. Uh, when you hit 200 Google reviews, you start to get one new client every one to two weeks. So uh, one, of the, one of the clients in, in my last program was a vet. And vets usually have clients that come to them within a 10K radius. And she's now gone on, I think she's got three or 400 Google reviews. Uh, she said to me the other day, she's found now that she's getting clients coming to her from within 30 Ks, passing six other vets to get to her. Wow. So for her, it wasn't even just a case of getting a bigger piece of the pie. She's actually managed to grow the pie based on her Google review strategy. Yeah, talk about making the competition irrelevant. When you're driving past six of them, it, it does you don't get more, <laughs> you don't get more definitive than that. Yeah. So, you know, and, and for us at Xenox, we found whenever somebody comes in. And they say that they're there from a, from a Google review point of view. They generally make a decision faster. They spend more and they don't care about the competition. Do you find there are any sort of businesses that are more suited to this, like vets or jewelry stores or geographically bricks and mortar type things? No, I, I've done it with, um, like I had one company that was like a, a company like Airbnb. And they like within eight months of you know following the frameworks, they put on like six hundred Google reviews. So it honestly, I've I've yet to find a business that it doesn't work for. Uh, it, but there's a whole strategy around you know the happiness window and doing the right thing at the right time and using the right scripts and and making sure that you've got people empowered in the right key positions. Uh, to make sure that that experience is what it needs to be. And are you working with people one-to-one -to, -one to develop that or is it a group format or how does it work? Uh, I, I always run them as a group. I mean, apart from apart from the fact that it's obviously much more leverageable for my time, uh, I find that there's a real co cross-pollination that happens. It's really cool. So, you know, the vet could be listening to something that an electrician is doing or I might be workshopping something with somebody and someone else could go, ah, that's really cool. So like I was customer journey mapping one of the vets and I sort of said, look, okay, what happens here? Okay, what happens there? What happens here? What happens there? And we got to a point in the, in the customer journey where they said, okay, and then, then the front team rings the client for a discharge appointment. I said, do you call it that? I went, yeah, because you see they're medical professionals. So discharge is a medical term. And I said to you, if, if, if I told you to think about a bodily discharge, what do you think about? Yeah. Probably not something very pleasant. So pleasant. We, workshop, we workshop the name of their appointment and, and now that's called a reunite session. So <laughs> now, when the, now when the front staff are ringing up their uh, client to say, hey, uh, Glenn, we'd like to reunite you with Fluffy. Uh, what time works for you to come down and pick her up? It has a completely different feeling to it than, you know, we want to book you in it for a discharge appointment. 
And then, you know, we took out the payment side of things so that that happened before the client. So that when the client turns up, it's all about being re- reunited with their fur baby. Oh, that's cool, man. That's super smart. I love that. I love the reunite session. And I love especially doing the payment beforehand so they can just show up and they don't have to handle any functional logistics. It's just all emotion. Yeah. But, but somebody else could listen to that and kind of go, hey, I'm a XYZ business. I could totally do that. That works just the same for me. Do you see yourself, like, like, cause obviously it's clear you're a customer experience guy, right? And you're a surprise and delight guy. Um, and you're kind of about creating those. Do you see a future focusing more exclusively on that without the five star review element and sort of switching yeah. around as a priority? Cause that alone could be like everything you've been talking about on here. I can imagine that as, author, speaker, commentator, big stages, business advisor, corporate, small yeah. business, the whole bit? Yeah, that's 100% my strategy. So the plan is, uh, you know, in, I would say in the next one to two years is to get the program running in such a way that I can actually hand the delivery of that part of the program over to somebody else to actually do the running and implementation for. And then my job is to do the customer journey mapping, to go into big business um, that might say, look, you know, we really need to fundamentally change uh, the way that we interact and, and our clients experience our brand and product. Uh, and to have someone like me come in there with the, the filter and, and the way I see the world and kind of go, well, here's the brand strategy, here's the plan, here's the whatever it is that you need uh, around that side. So that's definitely where, where I'll be heading in the next couple of years. I also know you're big on this idea of business for good. Do you just want to kind of explain a little bit of your philosophy and perspective around, you know, service contribution, giving back beyond yeah. money? Yeah. So in the diamond business, uh, we make a donation from every ring that we sell to the Starlight Foundation because we believe that, uh, you know, we make wishes come true uh, from an engagement and wedding point of view and like, having four kids and, and I know you've got a, a two and a half year old. It's just like, if something would ever happen to our kids, you know, you, you would give any money for them to, to have the quality of life that you want them to have. Uh, and so the fact that there are these organizations, organizations out there doing that, I, I think that if you're in an opportunity to give, you should do that. So each starlight wish costs about six and a half thousand dollars a year. And we generally grant about eight wishes in a year. So uh, just from the rings that we sell and, and the impact and the contribution that we can make there. Um, we do some stuff in the, in the space with B1G1. So in the five-star capacity, uh, I've got an EA who's in the Philippines. Uh, so we make donations from the programs that we run to go on and support social entrepreneurship in the Philippines. So I, th- I think, it's, I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's a great concept to be able to give back and pay it, and pay it forward. And how have you found your team respond to that? Is that something that you do and it's sort of top down and it's just part of the system or are they involved and, and how does that um, work? Yeah, so the, the wonderful thing about the, the Starlight Foundation is that they run these days at the, in the Starlight Ward there where your team can go in there and, you know, make these crowns with like sticky pieces of paper and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, they, they do like to get involved and it's it's connecting them with, uh, the ultimate result and the benefit of what we as a business are able to provide. So uh, I think it's really, really important. And, and uh, to see the, the smiles on the kids' faces, uh, no one, you, you can't really walk away from that and not, not feel moved or touched by it. Mate, if, if someone wanted to, well, first of all, how can people kind of reach out to you? And I mean, I've, I've had you speak to our groups on customer experience, on five-star reviews. We always get five-star feedback uh, from those. Um, I guess if someone's hearing this going, I want more of Carl, yeah. what, what, should, what should they do and like beyond maybe just a, an engagement ring and a diamond? And, and you know, I, I tell anyone that comes across me that's like thinking of getting engaged, I, I send them your way because you certainly uh, – you certainly did a fantastic job for me and for everyone that I've sent you away. So that's number one. Five-star reviews is obvious. How do people find out about that? So they can go to my website, which is my five-star reviews. So that's MY, the number five star reviews. Um, on there, there's the scorecard uh, for them to take, which is 25 questions on you know where their Google review strategy is at right now. And, and it will give you a report at the end as to you know maybe some of the low-hanging fruit that you can interact with. 
Uh, there's there's some more information in there around models, but you can ultimately reach out to me uh, through that way or even on LinkedIn just with my first and last name. Beautiful. And if someone wants something beyond that, like having you speak at an event or potentially doing some in-house higher end consulting where it's just like come in and do some magic for us. Yeah. So yeah, they, again, probably LinkedIn is probably going to be the best way for them to reach out to me or, or through the website. Uh, I'm pretty responsive on both of those. Right. I love it. If you had some, now for any KPIs that might be listening to this that are kind of in the middle of their kind of first year of KPI, which can be heavy and noisy and like, oh, there's like a, a rebirth often happening. Given yeah. your experience and, of course, because you're a, a coach from time to time for our clients, we'd love to have you come in and, and work with our groups. What would you say to people listening to this that potentially don't have you as uh, as one of their coaches and guides through the program? What, what would you say to people that are in the middle of it right now? Uh, like it works. Honestly, the, the, the framework and every, I, I honestly wouldn't, don't think I would be here today if it wasn't for KPI. And that's not a paid endorsement by Glenn, but it's, uh, it honestly just works. Trust the process, trust the, um, the mentors inside the program, be diligent with the work and just take it one step at a time. Don't be overwhelmed. Just, just take it one step at a time and, and execute on each one of the, f- the five P's because it honestly works. And uh, where you are 12 months or even 24 months from now will be unrecognizable, unpredictable, and totally irreversible. <laughs> I love it. You're so beautiful with words. Thank you, mate. And once again, let me just acknowledge, I, I was so looking forward to this conversation because you just execute so beautifully. And I think if anyone went to Xenox, if anyone went to my five-star reviews, they're going to see... Uh, just how well you act. And if, if you're in Brisbane and you have the chance to actually go to Xenox and have a whiskey, I highly, highly encourage you to uh, to do that. Take advantage. And if he, uh, if he starts, if Carl, you start pulling a, a glass from the top shelf, um, I encourage everyone to say, hang on a minute. We, we, we'll listen to the Dent podcast. We want the, we want the secret covered. <laughs> um, and so, mate, just thank you. Thank you for being the kind of person that just applies what you do to the highest possible level. Thank you for so much for caring about people and just giving a shit about the work that you do and putting your, your love and your energy into it. And thank you for sharing it so generously um, back to, to our community and, and to the world. I, I appreciate you. Mate, thank you so much and uh, right back at you. Um, for any of you that potentially are not a in the, the KPI community at yet, um, I'd encourage you to do this. If you're interested in experiencing some of the kind of results that, that Carl has through building his profile, transforming his business, being able to pivot in times of crisis, et cetera, I highly encourage you to go check out the Key Person of Influence scorecard. Um, it's a tool that we've created. Um, Carl was just mentioning you can also go and do his uh, uh, scorecard on my five-star reviews, which is essentially a benchmarking tool. So what we've done is we realized that it's easy to say, um, do you have an ability to influence in your industry? Yes, no, maybe. It's a bit fuzzy. There's a big difference when you can quantify it because the moment it can be quantified, you can then identify strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities for growth. It's totally free. Just Google key person of influence scorecard. It'll pop up, and depending where you are in the world, it'll take you down a little bit of a rabbit hole. We'll get you out a copy of the Key Person of Influence book. And um, if after going through that scorecard, you'd like to have a conversation with one of our specialists about how to improve your score, we're happy to help. So once again, Carl, thank you, brother, for being here. Uh, I love all that you do for all of the listeners and the watchers. Thank you very much. Uh, The only thing to do now is uh, go make a dent in the universe. Thank you, mate. Thanks, buddy.